All right, well, it looks like it's, uh, it's about quarter two, so we might as well get going. Is this, is this thing on? You guys here? It is. All right, perfect. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about a little project we've been working on that we call Tugboat. Um, the basic idea is that it's, it's kind of a mix of uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment. Um, it's basically a, a tool that helps us be more efficient and, and build sites uh, faster and, and more easily. And obviously, we'll get into details kind of as we go. Uh, so just to kind of start things off, my name is Blake Hall. Uh, I'm a senior developer at Lullabot. Uh, Lullabot, for those of you that might not know, is a design, development, strategy, and consulting company. Um, we kind of simultaneously try to kick ass and have fun, which is not always the easiest thing to do, but um, we're making an effort all, all the time anyway. Uh, this is my colleague, uh, James Sansbury. He's a, a senior architect and development manager at Lullabot, um, and we've been working there for four Four and a half years, something like that. So uh, Tugboat, where did Tugboat come from? What is it? Why does it have a goofy name? Um, it's basically, like I said before, something that kind of fills the gap between uh, a, a traditional continuous integration tool like Travis, um, a task runner kind of like Jenkins that you can use to automate things um, on your behalf. And it, it fits somewhere oddly in between both of those. It's, it doesn't really replace them. Um, but it's not really exactly the same either. Um, it initially started life inside of Lullabot as something called the GitHub pull request builder. But we have this company policy that any of our little side projects have to have good names that would make cool t-shirts. And GitHub pull request builder doesn't really fit that recipe. It's a mouthful. It would be really hard to come up with a logo for. Um, since it is based pretty much around GitHub and, and the pull request workflow, we kind of pull, tug, boats, What's more fun than nerds on boats? Um, so that's where Tugboat came from. Um, like I said, it, it's basically a, a build tool. It sp spins up automated Drupal environments um, as you're kind of going through the development cycle. The primary effect we've noticed is that unlike some of the other build tools we've seen, Tugboat really works to increase the transparency and visibility that non-technical folks have into ongoing development. So while we're working away on features, project managers, folks in marketing, people that wouldn't actually set up their own uh, local Drupal environment for whatever reason, like it might be a pain in the neck, um, they have a way of sort of staying on top of and seeing what's going on with a project when, when we use Tugboat. Um, so, oops, sorry about that. Reveal and the down arrow. Um, so the, the biggest thing we've noticed is that uh, this is sort of the primary interface for Travis CI if you're a non-technical person. It's essentially functionally equivalent to the thumbs up emoji in GitHub, right? It's either a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Your build passes or it doesn't. That's the level of visibility you're getting with something like Travis. It's definitely great because you know whether you broke the build or not, but it doesn't actually provide anything tangible you can interact with aside from a this is good or this is bad. Um, so there's no kind of confidence um, that can be inspired there. The other UI... Uh, that you can kind of work with is Jenkins. That's a pretty popular alternative. I would guess uh, several of you, if not most of you in the room, are using Jenkins in one form or another. This isn't a UI you would want to hand to a non-technical person either. It's definitely one of those interfaces that was written by developers for developers, despite the Bob Ross happy clouds and little storm uh, icon stuff that's going on. Um, really useful, really, really powerful, but again, not necessarily at the level of user friendliness that, that we were looking for. So the rest of the talk, where are we going? What are we going to kind of cover and talk about? We're going to cover the why, sort of how this came about. James was really the one that got it started and, um, and saw the initial need for it uh, with the Tizen project. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about how it's been used uh, to help the MSNBC team build a really, really large site on a fast deadline. We'll talk about um, how we use it internally on lullabot.com and how it's helped us there a little bit. And then probably more importantly, how you guys can, can take some of these ideas to build a tool like this um, of your own if you don't want to uh, come in contact and actually work on the Tugboat project itself with us. Uh, and then we're going to close with kind of some ideas about other pieces we can plug into this um, in the future to kind of add functionality and, and augment what Tugboat already does and sort of other ways that we can, we can make development more transparent. So before we, before we do that, let's 
talk a little bit about kind of history and where we've been um, as far as Drupal development and deployment goes. So I assume uh, since this is the DevOps track, most of you guys have separate environments for your sites, right? You're not logging into production and hand editing PHP, uh, although we probably all did that at one point or another, right? Um, so the first step is kind of having siloed environments. And typically you've got code that's going up this, up this chart from development to staging to production. There are various ways in Drupal you can kind of accommodate that. But then you have data coming down the tree, so user-generated stuff like the actual content on the site, menu items, um, files that get uploaded, things like that. Drupal's been really good historically at handling um, pushing configuration up the stack. Going the other direction is a lot harder, and pushing content up the stack is also really hard. The content deployment uh, issue is something that we're totally not going to talk about and gloss over. We'll leave that for a core conversation. It's a, it's a really tough problem that, that we don't need to solve. Um, the, the essential pain that, that Tugboat uh, is, is meant to solve is uh, how the QA process and peer review process works as you're pushing configuration up uh, from development to staging and production. So that's kind of uh, where we'll go. And ultimately what we found is it winds up cutting the length of time it takes for new features to get merged and pushed into actual production code. So Drupal's first kind of big hook, at least um, since I've been in the community, for doing this sort of configuration management stuff are update hooks, right? We've all probably written update hooks before. They're kind of a pain in the ass. Um, it's, it's a slow process to work with. I don't think anybody ever gets it right on the first try unless it's really easy. So then you wind up dumping your database, re-importing it, rerunning it. Batch API is, is very handy and useful, but I find myself having to look at the documentation every time I try to use it. Um, it's, it's just, it's not the most elegant way we can push configuration around. And if, if somebody comes in on the production site and makes some changes that you didn't get in an update hook, you're out of sync all of a sudden, and there's no way to kind of replicate that and keep a record of, of what's gone on. So the tool that most of us completely abuse to do this now is features module. Features is really great at getting things like views or panels config into code, into version control, something that you can get a diff from to look at and, and kind of push through this process. I remember sitting in a room uh, in DrupalCon, uh, at DrupalCon in, in DC when the development seed folks first introduced this. And I remember at that time I wasn't working at a, a consultancy or an agency. I was just one guy working on a site. And for me, the update process was the biggest pain in the neck because there was no really clean way to manage this stuff. And I remember sitting in that first talk before the first beta came out thinking, I'm going to abuse the hell out of this because this is really going to save me a lot of time and make my life easier. Well, we've all been doing that for probably, what, five, six years now? And there are a lot of pain points using features as a deployment tool because that's not actually what it was intended for. It may not be a tool we necessarily like, but it's sort of the tool we've got right now working with Drupal 7 sites. So Drupal 8. Drupal 8 comes with the promise of the configuration management initiative. I think it's definitely a good thing that Core now has an API that will support kind of import, export, sync. Um, some of the things that features were essentially providing uh, itself will now be part of Core. So other modules will have a pretty reliable way of building on top of that. It's definitely a good thing, but fundamentally it doesn't address the complete problem of how you get code in one of your development branches up to production faster in a more reliable way. In part because you're not only working with the code configuration, you're also working with content, but also just because um, large projects get really complicated. There are lots of moving pieces, and if people don't look at the, at the diffs for every, every individual part, they can sometimes have unexpected consequences kind of pushing each other back and forth. So the big thing that, that Tugboat has helped us with is make our work as developers easier. Uh, it, it turns out that we can kind of deploy features in a more repeatable, rel reliable way, which is really what automation is all about in DevOps. And it increases the visibility that non-technical folks have into our kind of process and progress. So the big question that Tugboat is kind of built to answer is what would this code look like if we push the deploy button right now? And James will talk a little bit more about kind of that problem space. 
so yeah, we've we've been talking about all the the great improvements we've been making on our deployment process, right? We've been working on this for years now. We've been trying to make it easier to deploy Drupal sites, and we've created a process for that. It's not everyone does it the same way, but we've we've been working on that process. And all of this great progress that that Blake has been describing comes at a cost, right? And that cost is that now it's slow and it's complicated, actually, to deploy these sites. When things slow down uh, in this process, it takes longer for the people that need to see the work for them to actually see the work that we're trying to do, right? So here at Lullabot, we usually do one, one or two week sprints. Uh, we're doing you know agile development, one or two week sprints. and. Through that process, at the, end of the, at the end of that one or two weeks, we'll do a demo of what we actually built, right? If our clients or the stakeholders or the project managers, the designers, uh, external teams, if they can't see the work that we've been doing until that demo, until the day of that demo, how many of you guys have been in that situation where all of a sudden then, you know, the designer is like, uh, actually, you misunderstood what I meant, or... Uh, maybe the stakeholder was like, well, now that I see that working this way, we don't really want it to work that way. You know, now that I see, I, that is what I asked for, but now that I see it in action, that's not what I want. You know, so we're, when you have that taking two weeks to get to that point, you know, we've, co we've come from, we think that that's actually like really efficient, right? Because we've come from waterfall or whatever it might be where it's like, <laughs> you you get all your requirements at the beginning, and then here you go, and and that's not cool. <laughs> um, but when when that happens here, uh, what ends up happening is that uh, this this obviously is really really expensive, and even more expensive when you have large teams that are working for two weeks siloed off. Then the stakeholder sees it, and you have to kind of start over from scratch. So back in that that Stone Age era of uh, before we had all these nice processes as well, it was pretty easy to show the work to that stakeholder, right, or the project manager, um, because you were either working right on production, um, <laughs> or you could just have them look over your shoulder or whatever and see what you were working on. Or if you had someone that was pretty technically savvy, they could, you know, it was simple enough at that point where they could step through and probably build it themselves and see. Uh, see what you were doing, right, or see what the change was was that was going to happen. Uh, but but Drupal's so much more complex. This process is so much more complex now, and it's so much slower. We can't expect our stakeholders to know how to do this anymore. So traditionally, the way around this has been to create large releases, right? So now we work in these large releases, and uh, and we get those large releases into a QA environment, right? And then we have Everyone look at that environment with everything all baked in together. Uh, everything's touching everything else. And we've got to test it all together, right? Um, and then what happens, right? We have one little bug in one feature that no one even really cares about ends up sinking the whole ship. And now the release is blocked. And we've got all these critical things that need to get out and it's all baked together, right? It's all stuck together, and so now everyone's scrambling. Everyone's if 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 you're whatever day you're doing deployments on that whole day is ruined because everyone's like, we've got to fix the release. This has to go out tomorrow because of whatever, right? Has this has this happened to you guys? Never. No, of course not. <laughs> <Rookie>. <laughs> Rookie. <laughs> Rookie mistake. The other interesting phenomenon that happens when this starts to happen is that uh, once this release gets blocked, you still have other teams that might be working on the next release. And so then these releases actually start getting bigger because, oh, we had to push this one back. And so now let's roll it into the next release. And now you have it's even bigger and even more bugs that might, might come about because these things are kind of colliding with each other. And the way to get around all of this mess is we often start to make compromises on the process we've created in order to pay off that debt, right? The process is incurring a debt, and, we're, and we're, we're taking shortcuts around it. All of this stuff that we've been talking about, we're making trade-offs, right? We've, over the past 
however many years in Drupal development, we've been starting to make trade-offs in, in as, as our projects grow in complexity and size, we need to make some trade-offs. So the first trade-off we're making, sorry that, that that looks actually a little small. Hopefully you guys can read that. The first trade-off we're making, we're making uh, the trade-off for, like we've been saying, stakeholder visibility for project testability. And another trade-off we've been making is process agility for project stability. Those are probably wise trade-offs, you know, in the grand scheme of things. We want the project to be stable. We want it to be testable. But by creating this consistent and testable deployment process, we've slowed things down to where it takes much longer for our stakeholders to see what we're building. And if we slow that down, that touches everything, right? Everything suffers from that process. We've created a bunch of amazing ways we can QA our Drupal sites, but that all makes the process slower and it makes the process murkier. How many of you guys have experienced this? <laughs> it worked fine on my local. Like, I, I just tested it on my local site, and it worked completely fine. <laughs> so again, all of the ways that we, used, that, that we cut corners to get around this pain of how slow and complicated it is, that's why we run into this. Because guess what? Well, I skipped the DB reimport, or I didn't sync down on the files, or I'm using, you know, I'm using cool modules like stage file proxy so that I'm not actually, I don't have a local copy of the files. Um, or I, I actually didn't revert all of the features. That sort of stuff is what, what, uh, what creates this problem. All of these shortcuts cause inconsistent behavior across environments. So yeah, that's it. Um, I don't have any ideas on how to solve this, so I hope you guys have a great session. If you have any ideas, come up afterwards and no. You get it. There's, yeah, there's a lot of problems, right? So what can we do about it? So what if we could, you know, eat our cake and, that, and yet still have it? What if we could have that, we could show stakeholders what we're working on right away? What if we could catch regressions before they ever happened? What if we could squash those bugs before they ever, ever even made it to QA? And what if we could like detect performance, visual, functional regressions before that code ever even got merged into our master branch or whatever you guys are using uh, for your main code, the code that goes to production? production. So Blake mentioned before the Tizen project. So this is what we actually built Tugboat to solve, this very problem, right? And it all started with the Tizen project. Tizen, if you're not familiar with it, is a mobile operating system, uh, among other things. And there are three websites for it. This is a project that is a joint effort between Intel and Samsung and the Linux Foundation. And there are three Drupal websites. It's a multi-site installation. There's tizen.org, developer.tizen.org, and source.tizen.org. And on this project, we have this super technically savvy uh, stakeholder, Meg Shaver. He's great. He, he knows all about Drupal. He could build views. He can do a lot of the work that actually we do for him. But guess what? He doesn't have the time to do that. And he do also doesn't have the time to test our work before it actually gets merged in. He doesn't have the time to go in there and download three databases and set up a local environment and check things out to make sure they're working as he expects them to before it gets merged in. So Tugboat started out as a set of very basic bash scripts to act as a sort of glue. Uh, we've got all these tools, right? We've got Jenkins working for us. We've got Drush working for us. We've got our configuration and features. All of that stuff we're trying to do to make our process work. We've got all these tools. What we need is a little bit of glue, right? So we've got up on the top of this picture, uh, this is our production environment. And down at the bottom is our new little happy feature. 
And what these bash scripts would do is it's not nothing really you know fancy or anything. It just goes through the same process that it would go through in deploying this code to production, but it does it in an environment. It gives this a URL. It gives this feature, whatever's being worked on, a URL that anyone can go to, whether it's a developer that's doing peer review or if it's Mike Shaver that needs to look at our features. So we created this, uh, these scripts to solve this problem so that Mike, anytime we create a new pull request, it automatically detects, hey, there's a new pull request. So I'm going to clone the production database. I'm going to spin up this Drupal site, and I'm going to create it at this URL, and every URL happens to have the pull request, the GitHub pull request ID in the URL. So, uh, so each site has a unique, um, a unique URL, and it's actually doing it across all three sites. So, hey, I may, I may actually be working on code that's only for the developer site, but Mike wants to make sure it didn't break the other two sites, you know? So it actually is spinning up all three sites. Are any of you guys familiar with the uh, Simply Test Me? Uh, anyone raise your hand if you're familiar with that. So it's very similar to that, except that Simply Test Me is spinning up a, f a fresh Drupal site, right? And, and this is spinning up three Drupal sites with production database, with production files, and it's doing it automatically when a new pull request is, is pushed up. MSNBC. This <coughs> saved us a tremendous amount of time on MSNBC. Uh, so we, we had these bash scripts. They were basically written for the Tizen project, but when we wrote them, you know, we tried to keep in mind that, hey, this actually might be useful for other projects. And it turned out to be tremendously useful for MSNBC. They had a super aggressive timeline and a highly complicated site to build in that timeline. So like I said, Tugboat, the way we built it, it, it's building a URL, basically, for work that we're doing. And this is great. This turned out to be huge for the MSNBC project in this area for, for our external team. So uh, we had to integrate with the Newsvine project, uh, and they, they were kind of plugging in various features into the MSNBC site, so like commenting and stuff like that. And they were working on their API while we were working on creating the site, and things were changing on both ends, right? And that's, if, you, if any of you guys have worked with that, that can be really frustrating, because you have to work a little bit, then you, you know, run into problems, send it over to them, then they're looking at what you're working in, working with, and they run into problems with what you've written, it's back and forth. <coughs> so what Tugboat has allowed us to do is to have a single place where, okay, we can bang out some code, and show it to the Newsvine team. And then they can come back and say, okay, can you tweak this? And then they can also realize, okay, I see we've got a bug over here. We need to change this. Because um, they can plug in their, their tools into this environment. But it's not just for, for these external teams where it's been helpful. It's been helpful for internal projects as well. So we have uh, epics where a, a huge project is being worked on with our internal team. Uh, how you know we want a place where anyone can look to see the status of that project. It's got to be fully baked before it gets merged in, right? Where do we? Where can we go to see that work uh, right now w at whatever state it's at? Tugboat has been great for that. Um, trying to think of an example of that right now. We're we're working on some some polling, uh, some live real time polling feature, and so again we're working with an external. Uh, service in that, but there's also, we can actually work as a team on this Epic. There's a URL. It's got a pull request for that feature, and anyone at any point can go and see how it's working. You guys remember Blake talking about hook update N and the, the pains of writing update hooks. So this tugboat has actually been great for that as well uh, because I can work on that update hook and I don't have to re-import the, the database every time. I can let Tugboat do it for me. Uh, so I can make a little tweak, push it up, and then I'll go work on something else for a little while. And then I'll come back, you know, when I'm, when I'm done with that, I'll come back and check to see if it did what I expected it to do. Or other things. I mean, there's lots of times when, when you're in the middle of something, 
and you don't want to have to refresh your database, you can just quickly create a pull request for the code that you think is going to work. If it doesn't work, it's not the end of the world. You've, you know, you're, not, you're not sending it to anywhere, but just as a separate branch of code. So, so basically what, what James is kind of talking about is that classic XKCD comic where they're rolling around on chairs sword fighting. And, you know, they're kind of asking what's going on, and, and the developers yell back, compiling, compiling. Tugboat kind of takes away your sword fighting time in some ways, um, which may or may not be a good thing. We've also really found it useful just internally. So like James mentioned, initially written for Tizen, we, we pretty much unapologetically uh, adopted it for use on lullabot.com as well. Um, it's kind of the typical cobbler's children have no shoes sort of scenario. I think to be polite about it, our redesign last year, the launch of that took a while. I mean, it was, a, it was a pretty slow process. We just had a really hard time finding developers that weren't doing client work, that had free time to actually work on a feature. So, you know, we, we would sort of get five hours one week, and then three weeks later you'd have another ten hours to try to work on a feature. And we're all kind of perfectionists, so we all wanted to see something through. But if you're not keeping your local up to date by working on a site every day, it's really kind of hard to, to do an adequate job peer reviewing. But with these tugboat environments, we actually had a URL that we could go to that was being updated every time code was pushed. So between the GitHub code review tools and using tugboat's environment to actually click around and interact with the site, we could, in my case, I know I did this several times, just hand edit views exports without even having a local set up on my site, on my laptop at all and just push code and it builds an environment and I can make sure it worked. Um, that was a, a huge time saver. Um, the other thing is, is in this case, you know, it's obviously lullabot.com is not the same scale as Tizen. It's not the same scale as MSNBC in terms of complexity and traffic. But we were definitely interacting with a lot of non-technical folks, even on a small project. So people from marketing obviously have some input. Somebody's, um, you know, somebody's cousin doesn't like a particular article. Like, you can incorporate that feedback if you have a URL to send somebody to show off work. So that was, that was really, really valuable. And the other thing is um, the, the Tizen project now, uh, we're, still, we're still using Tugboat. Um, James has moved on to, to work on MSNBC, and I've kind of taken over stewardship of that there. But right now it's basically a development team of three of us. Um, me, my colleague Brock Boland, who's also a Lullabot, and Mike Shaver still. And we're using it constantly all the time as a way to peer review each other's code without kind of getting off track. So uh, when I started working with Mike, it was, it was about a year ago, shortly after the launch of lullabot.com, and it was on a different Intel project. And Mike said, this has been so successful on Tizen, I want the same thing, set this up the first week of the project. So this was my first exposure to Tugboat at the time. And like James mentioned, it's, it's basically just a bunch of glue and bash scripts at this point. So setting it up was actually kind of a hassle. Um, I, had, I had to install Jenkins. I had to get the right plugins. Uh, Jenkins stores all its config in XML, which changes differently depending on which plugin versions you have. So the Jenkins config wasn't necessarily portable. Um, it, it you know probably was a two or three day setup process, which over the course of a project, setting something like this up in three days isn't a big deal. It saves more than that amount of time over the life of the project. But still, it's a three-day setup process. So we tried to figure out how we could cut that down and make this part of just a normal uh, project kind of startup uh, and, and cut the ramp-up time down. So the first thing that kind of occurred to me is who doesn't like Drush, right? We all use Drush all the time to save a ton uh, of interaction with the actual website. What if we could have something kind of like Drush for interacting with this tugboat setup? So that's basically what I spent my time doing. I wrote uh, a little Node.js based command line wrapper around some of this bash script and glue stuff that we had as, as um, Tugboat as it existed then. I also found uh, a pretty handy Jenkins API. So you can do things like uh, trigger job pushes from the command or trigger job runs from the command line, um, export and diff the actual Jenkins XML config. So you can get the the Jenkins configuration that makes up your tugboat setup in version control, the same way you would with features. So even though I said it's kind of the tool we're stuck with, not necessarily the tool we want, I kind of reinvented it for, for Jenkins um, in this case. 
The other big thing uh, that we added was uh, prior to this, Tugboat had basically been something that only responded to GitHub pull requests. But uh, Joe Schindler, who works on Drupal Eyes Me, really wanted to use it, and they're not using GitHub internally, and they're not using pull requests. So he was kind of stuck. Uh, so I tweaked the code a little bit so we can now build arbitrary environments. So if you want to pass in a commit hash or a branch that's not quite a pull request yet, or a date in time uh, from a particular branch. All of that kind of stuff will follow the merge path that's kind of set up in the config file. So you can see what would happen if that particular arbitrary uh, git reference tree-ish uh, was deployed in production right away. Another thing we added um, was a really, really, really rudimentary and basic plugin system. So we could do things like kick off uh, bhat test runs or uh, use Phantom, or I think it's Casper in the case of MSNBC. Uh, you can do that kind of stuff from the same command line uh, tool. Um, you can also back up the staging site using this, so you can do that downsync kind of in one um, one interaction, just like Drush SQL Sync does, really. Uh, but it's also, uh, on Tizen at least, used for the actual code deployment itself, because it's the same tool that builds these tugboat sites can can push to production as well. The most exciting thing <clears throat> excuse me, that we've been working on lately was integration with Resemble.js. I don't know how many people might be familiar with this, but it's basically a tool that helps with uh, visual regression testing. So you can regression test your CSS, uh, which is, is pretty mind-blowing. Um, under the hood, it uses Phantom, which is a headless WebKit browser. Uh, it's all JavaScript-based. We'll kind of take a look at the output here. So this is a screenshot from developer.tizen.org like two days after we found out the session was accepted. Um, here's the screenshot from my local at the same time. So if I kind of flip back and forth between the two, you'll notice there are a few things that have changed a little bit. But unless you've got kind of a keen eye, it's not immediately obvious um, what's different. Piping those two through Resemble gives you something like this. So what it's actually doing is it's taking in an array of URLs, so you can test multiple pages per run, and an array of uh, um, resolutions, so you can test different breakpoints if you have a responsive design, and saving off JPEGs for each one of those URLs at each breakpoint. Then it takes the two, so in this case from the actual live developer site and then my local that will become a pull request, and it does a pixel-by-pixel -pixel comparison of the two, and produces this visual diff. So this gets posted back to GitHub as a, as a comment or, or an image link in the comment. So you can kind of quickly skim through and see, you know, oh, something's definitely wrong with this particular pull request. And in this case, if you actually take a look at it, um, up near the top you can see there's uh, the Your Own Application Now line. I hadn't downsynced the production database in a few days, so there was a legitimate content change. So it's just me kind of being lazy. Um, there's a missing image a little bit off the screen that you can't see that was part of part of this original uh, image. So again, something like stage file proxy, you know, cutting that corner would have showed up here. And then, uh, by and large, most of the diff here is I didn't have Typekit properly set up on my local, so all the fonts are just slightly off. But the idea is that if you introduce you know a, a bug where you're working on a feature for say the photo gallery and all of a sudden a couple blocks in the right sidebar are off a few pixels, you'll be able to pick this up really, really quickly and kind of in an automatic way uh, with something like this. So we've been talking for quite a while about the why and a little bit about the how, but let's get into kind of the nuts and bolts for how you can do this yourself. Um, the wrapper code that I've talked about for Tizen isn't uh, publicly available yet. We're still kind of working on it and figuring out uh, where we want to take it and what we want to do with it. That part I definitely want to be a conversation, kind of both for the QA and then the rest of the week you can come up and find one of us and we'll figure out sort of what we want to turn this into. But the actual, the actual glue and, and bubble gum and duct tape and shoelaces uh, is out there for you to, to set this up on your own now if, if that's something you want to do. Um, it's all the precursor code for that first version of Tugboat we talked about. So MSNBC and Lullabot.com are actually still using the first version of Tugboat. The only people that are using the second uh, right now are, are Tizen. Um, about a year ago, if you go to, to our site, you can check the blog. 
Uh, Jared Bittner wrote an article um, that goes into this in, in pretty great depth. Like He essentially gave our session in print in July of last year. Uh, all the resources are linked to here. He kind of walks through the whole process. Um, at this point, it was still called the GitHub Pull Request Builder. So if you hadn't heard of it, it's because it was poor marketing on our part, maybe. Um, <laughs> but all the, all the pieces are there. One of the key... Um, one of the key pieces that you can l get linked to from that blog post is this Jenkins GitHub Drupal repository. This is on GitHub uh, in the Lullabot organization. These are those shell scripts that, that James mentioned. So there's one that takes care of cloning the site. There's one that takes care of setting up the directories in a particular way that, that Jenkins expects them to be set up. There's one that takes care of commenting back to GitHub on the status of a build after the build's finished. And then there's another one that handles cleanup, so wiping the site out after somebody's kind of said, yep, this is good, it's been merged in, it's, it's kind of past muster. The other key piece uh, that you need when you're setting this up, aside from installing Jenkins, is the Jenkins GitHub plugin. Um, and uh, that's a dependency for the Jenkins pull request builder plugin. So what this basically takes care of is listening to GitHub unfortunately via polling, which is a little bit silly, uh, for those pull request events, and then grabbing the code and doing the merge on your local disk directory. Um, and then Tugboat kind of takes off from there having had uh, having had the, the code for the pull request checked out. Tugboat handles the merge and the rest of the Drupal site build. So um, that's, that's kind of the status of, of what's out there now and what we've been working on. The next big question, and, and the thing I really want to talk about the rest of the week, if, if folks are interested in this, is where do we take this next? How do we make this even easier? How do we get features from development to production faster? Uh, what kinds of things can we do to this to provide more value, both for the people we're building sites for and for ourselves to make our lives easier? So one of the first things is to take a pretty honest look at what we've built so far. I, I kind of poked fun before at Travis's interface and Jenkins' interface, our interface at the moment, at least in two-thirds of the instances that are out there, is a GitHub comment. So that's kind of equally uh, lame, I guess, as far as kind of UX polish goes. The difference is it's accessible still, and it provides more meaningful information than a Travis build passing badge would. Um, and it's not as cluttered as an entire Jenkins UI. So if, if someone wants to know, you know, did, did the... Did the feature ticket for the photo gallery build successfully or not, they can hit the GitHub issue for that feature and see the big green GitHub check mark with links to that uh, links to that custom environment right on the GitHub ticket. They don't have to go to Jenkins and know what the name of the job was and find whether the last build succeeded or not. Oh, and there were probably parameters passed to that job that you have to check out to make sure you're looking at the right one. Um, it's just, it's a bit easier. Um, when it's in line with GitHub. The other thing, uh, this is kind of the simplest version. It just has links to the three ties and environments and a link to, to destroy the current environment that's built. In a couple of other instances, like I mentioned before, we'll have those resemble JS screenshots posted along to the GitHub comment, or we'll have links to other test results, whether it's BHAT or, or Phantom or Casper. Um, essentially anything else we've kind of plugged into the build process for a particular tugboat environment we can have those artifacts available in the GitHub comment as well. GitHub's API is, is pretty nice when it comes to that sort of thing. So rather than continuing on that API, the, the vision that we kind of have and the thing that we're building towards right now is uh, working on project-specific dashboards. So we'll have sort of one overarching screen that will list all of the different tugboat environments for a given project. So if you're, if you're a project manager, you could hop on this and say, you know, here are the four open pull request environments with URLs for those features that I can click into and sort of see how things are going for each feature. We could have stats uh, on each one of those individual tugboat environment builds on um, here are performance regressions. Uh, the cache grind file is, you know, 17% slower with this particular pull request issue build. Or uh, here are the HAR archive for the front end waterfall. Um, compared to production. And we can do some sort of performance metrics in a way that's, that's pretty uh, low friction for developers, but also uh, high value. We don't have to kind of keep track of those files. We can just auto-generate them and, 
make them somewhere easily available and useful. <coughs> the other thing we want to do is to provide some of the Jenkins type UI with this. So to let project managers kick off a new build if they know uh, some extra code has kind of been pushed. So we've got uh, two more just kind of administrative slides, and then we want to open it up for questions and, and kind of start that dialogue. The first is, uh, if you're interested in any of this kind of stuff, we're hiring, lullabot.com slash jobs. Coincidentally, you'll see two very, very good-looking guys on the top of that page. You go <laughs> check it out. Uh, and then the second one is, uh, tomorrow evening, uh, Lullabot's hosting a party at the Handlebar. Uh, it's 121 East 5th Street at 7 p.m., so... Hopefully we'll see you guys there and we can talk more about this kind of uh, DevOps process stuff uh, if we can't catch you beforehand. So that's kind of all we've got. Uh, otherwise, we'll just sort of open the floor to questions and hopefully hear more. So I must have missed it. What was the image comparison tool called? Uh, Resemble.js. Resemble.js. Thank you. Yep. On the same topic, uh, does Resemble.js provide any kind of scoring for the deviations between the images it compares so you can automate stuff for reviews? Yes. Cool. Uh, that was the first one. Uh, the second one, uh, what is the infrastructure behind all of this that you are using? It's cool to know that, yeah, there is a tool that can do this magic, but there has to be a, like workhorses behind this that will mm -hmm. uh, uh, spin up these environments. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, like... Sure. What is powering it? So that's that's one of the things we didn't we didn't talk about, but I think it's another bullet point for where we see this going in the future. I would love if this was leveraging something like Vagrant, and if we had kind of a config file for how the the staging environment, at least if not the production environment, gets built, and local devs could use that for their own development environment. We're using the same Vagrant config to spin up these environments uh, for the for Tugboat itself where uh, Ben, who's sitting right in front of you, is working on that right now um, as well. But at the end of the day, I think all the instances that we have running, it's like a VPS with Linode or something, hardware-wise. So the, the resources for this are sort of limited by how big your database is, how many environments you're going to have simultaneously, um, that sort of stuff. But disk space now is, is pretty cheap, so it's not a huge concern. But do you... So, so it are these multiple environments just a huge multi-site for the project, or how does it work? So, yeah, so it's... Is this on? Hello. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's a wildcard virtual host for, on Apache, so it's, it's pretty basic. So each, like I was saying before, there's a, each GitHub pull request ID is a number. So if you can just think of the, the wildcard vhost being star dot whatever, and then it maps that to a directory. So it's not, it's not multi-site. Um, each one is, its in, is in its own directory, uh, encapsulated that way, but it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. Is there other questions you had related to so that? So you basically pull the sources, you pull the production database, you pull production mm -hmm. files, you deploy all of that in that subdirectory. Right. Yes, and for for large sites where we have where the files directory might be 30 gig or something like that, we're actually using hard linked uh, hard linked files so that we're not just blowing out our disk space if there's 20 different environments. So, I see. How how long does it take to deploy a site or a pull request? So, f MSNBC uh, currently the database is about three gig. Uh, and it's growing. You know, it's a news site. The content is just streaming in every day all the time, right? Uh, it's currently about 3 gig. It's probably bigger than that, you know, <laughs> uh, since the last time I looked at it. So, And the way we're actually... So it, it did get to be slow, actually, because of that. You know, it took about 30 minutes for the whole thing to, to end, uh, to, to complete. And then once that's done, that's just the Drupal deployment. Then if we've got to run our Casper tests, which takes another 12 minutes. Um, so, you know, start to finish, that's 45 minutes. What we ended up doing, uh, first of all, we switched that Linode. Ben helped us switch that Linode to using one that uh, uses SSDs, 
which sped things up tremendously in that in that database import. And secondly, we're we're kind of doing uh, what I'm calling a hot spare database, where we import we import the database before we actually need it, and then all we're doing is renaming it for the one we need. And that that brought the time down to five minutes, four actually four minutes to spin up a new Drupal environment. So from pushing up the pull request to having an environment you could click into, that was four minutes. So really, it's just the time to revert features, clear caches, run database updates, and that sort of thing. Thank you. Yep. Well, and a, a corollary to that four minutes is the way the GitHub pull request builder works, the, the Jenkins plugin, it's actually polling GitHub looking for pull requests instead of using something like service hooks. So if, if we were using a different method to actually detect the pull request, like, say, ditching Jenkins, which I'm, a, I'm actually really in favor of, we could, we could get that essentially instantly and start building it without the possible polling lag time, too. Hello. Um, do you have any idea if it would work with GitLab? We, unfortunately, use that at work. <laughs> There's, um, there is work in progress to support different kind of random backends. Um, the, the shell scripts that are up there now are pretty tied to the GitHub pull request builder plugin, but the new version that we've been working on is essentially backend agnostic. The Drupalize Me team is using a different tool as well that's not GitHub, and they're very close to being able to use this. So that kind of pluggable backend, um, essentially the only thing it's used for is how the merge process works and how it figures out what code you've pushed needs to, needs to merge how um, to get into production. So that's certainly something we could support conceivably. Okay. Um, the other question was, is there um, a, a website or a place to find documentation or maybe status updates, how things are going? Hopefully. <laughs> um, we've, we've got one that we need to remove some lorem ipsum on. Um, okay. We're, we're crossing our fingers. We'll have it live this week. Okay. Um, so keep an eye on the Twitter account. Uh, otherwise, the, that blog post that I mentioned before mm -hmm. has kind of a ton of the documentation so okay. far. And I'll get, I'll get a link to the slides up on uh, the DrupalCon site, too. And you can, you can also email tugboat at lullabot.com. <laughs> Not lullaboat. <laughs> lullabot.com if you have any specific questions or ideas or anything. Uh, so this is really cool. I, I'm wondering, can you say a little bit more where the client sees all these spun up Drupal sites? Now you're, you're generating a lot of them. They're not monitoring them, are they? They're not getting automatic emails. I'm presuming, or they, maybe they are. Or are you sending them emails saying, I want you to look at this version now. It's ready for you to look at. So this is one of the big problems we're trying to address with the dashboard that we've been working on the last couple of weeks. Um, we, we totally need a way to kind of provide more visibility for that sort of thing. Right now, it's basically in the GitHub issue queue. So if there's, if there's a particular ticket that's, that's really high touch and high profile at a given time, there's a, a single comment from the Tugboat bot user that has links to all the environments. But we can definitely make that interaction for the non-technical person a lot more rich than it is right now. And that's like, that is definitely item number one on our radar that we're actively working on trying to improve. So if you have ideas of things like, things that you would like to see, definitely let's chat. So I would, I would love to hear your ideas. Hopefully this is quick. Um, so what is like the length of time that, like, or the amount of testing that's happening on these environments, and with that, are you doing any type of sanitization of the live data? So it might, in the case of MSNBC, like it probably doesn't apply, but um, as you guys know, the site that we work on has a very large user base, and we'd have to sanitize that data. So how would that affect this type of script? That's, that's a really good question. Um, baked into this is sort of an extra settings.php template file that gets appended on to the environment that gets built. So, like in Tizen's case, they use LDAP for all their authentication. They're not using the live LDAP server on staging or any of these tugboat sites that get spun up. They're using a, a separate staging server. So that sits in a little separate settings file, um, just config values that get stuck onto each one of these, uh, each one of these environments. We've also, <clears throat> I'm abusing this on my local, so I can run tugboat environments on my local to do peer review because it's easier for me than 
having to trash directories and, and change things because it also lets me test tugboat development as well. And as part of that on my local, I've changed the build script a little bit to do the email sanitization so I don't accidentally email people. Do, do you, is that affecting the performance time of the sync, or is it still pretty quick? It's pretty minor. I mean, it's... Okay. Even if you're getting into, like, 100,000 yeah, users? Yeah, okay. I'm done. Thank you. All right, thanks for your attention.